Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Sunday Night Live with Pasadena Church. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Can you believe it's the first Sunday of August already? While we are still in the middle of this terrible corona um, pandemic across our globe, and our nation is still suffering from extreme racial tensions, we're believing that the Lord is going to bring us through. He's going to heal us. He's going to deliver us. Until then, we will continue to pray and press forward in the name of the Lord. So will you join me? Let's go together into one of our previously recorded worship services as we acknowledge and celebrate our God, who is an awesome God. He's coming to us. Let's go meet him. Amen. Let's not let him come get us. Let's go meet him. Okay. Let's celebrate the awesomeness of our God. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says he's great. He's worthy to be praised. If you can, you can stand and worship with us. Sing the song with us. It says, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. Says, he can move he mountains. Can move mountains. Keep, me in the valley. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from Hide the rain. Me from the rain. He says, My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broke. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weak. And forever he'll reign. Come on, let's do that again. Say, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Hide me from the rain. Say, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broke. He heals me when I'm broke. Strength where I've been weak. Strength where I've been weak. And forever he'll forever. reign. Come on, if you believe that, lift your voice and say, My God is awesome. Come on, if you believe it, say awesome. Awesome. Hallelujah. Awesome. Say, My God is awesome. Awesome. Talking about my, my God. My God is awesome. Come on, if you believe it, lift your voice and say it. Awesome. Come on, testify one another. He's awesome. Awesome. Yes, he's awesome. Talking about my, my God. My God is awesome. Think about it. He's the Savior of the whole Savior world. Of the, whole the giver of salvation. Giver of salvation. And it's by his stripes we're healed. Me. Say, my God is awesome. My God is awesome. Today I am forgiven. Today I am forgiven. It's by his grace that his we are living. Come on, if you believe it, come on and praise his holy name. It's time to lift your voice and say it. My God is awesome. Come on, family, testify in his house. Awesome. Awesome. Testify, family. Awesome. My God. My God is awesome. Come on, if you believe it, lift your voice in this place. Awesome. Hallelujah, he's awesome. Awesome. Yes, he's awesome. Everybody say he's mighty. 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 He's awesome. Awesome. Come on and lift your voice and say awesome. Come on and say he's holy. 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 He's awesome. Voice and say, Awesome. 
is awesome. My God is awesome. You heal you when you're broken. Trust him this morning, family. Amen. Trust him this morning. He's an old Come on, tell the Lord, say, your love lifted me, your love me, your amazing love me, I am free to sing, everybody, to sing of your love. Come on, lift one hand in the air and say, how? you to know that we're standing with you we see you we see you navigating the headlines and processing your emotions we see your desire to move forward from pain to healing and I want to let you know that for me this has been a very emotional week as I watch the body of congressman John Lewis being uh, carried over the Edmund Pettus Bridge one final time. And I thought about how we lost such a huge voice, such a persistent fighter for civil rights in our country. My heart broke and I wept and I cried over our pain and our loss. And then I believe it was the next day or so I was watching the news and I saw, I saw how over 150,000 people died from coronavirus. And again, my heart broke and I wept. I cried over the pain and the loss. So many deaths, so many families grieving over their loved ones. And then just the other evening, we were watching an old TV program and we started remarking about our life pre-coronavirus, how close we were sitting by each other, how touchy we were, how we enjoyed simple things like going to see a movie in a packed theater. And it feels like we've set this marker of life before COVID-19 
and life after COVID-19. And we're all experiencing this marker. We're all experiencing this pain and this loss over what used to be. And then I thought about how just a few years ago, our 14-year-old daughter died and the devastating pain and loss that I felt at that time. And I remembered pain and loss is not the end of the story. Pain and loss is what points us to greater purpose in life. And I believe that God is leading us into something right here and now. In Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And I believe that God is leading us into greater purpose. He's leading us into doing something that is going to take the mixture of that pain and loss and create something good for mankind. And even though we live in uncertain times, we know this one thing is certain. This one thing is true, that our Heavenly Father is able to lift us. So let's pray. Oh God, we just thank you. We thank you that you are the one we can cry out to and call on in this day and in this time. We know, Father, that you sit in the place of all knowledge and all power and all authority, and nothing takes you by surprise. And so we declare with our own mouths, with our own lips, great are you, God. Great are you, God. Great is your faithfulness. You are the one we cry out to when we say, Lord, lift us. Lift us out of the anxiety. Lift us out of the fear. Lift us out of the pain. Oh God, we call on you, oh God, to come and be our rescuer in the name of Jesus. Oh God, your, this song says, Lord, you lifted me when I was down and out. You came and you rescued me. When I was all alone, you came and you rescued me. Your love lifted me. I am free to sing of your love. And so, Lord, those of us that are experiencing this pain and this loss, be that healing balm in Gilead, be that healing balm over those that are suffering from various cancers and diseases and diabetes, oh God, and this coronavirus, be that healing balm this day and hour. Father, we're crying out, Lord, for those of us that you are speaking to in this day for social change. Lord God, use the mixture of our pain and our loss to create something good for mankind. Oh Lord, we know that you are the solution and you're able to download solutions to us. So Lord, we're saying, here we are, God. We're standing in your presence. We're here to hear your voice and to do what you command us to do. We are not without hope, hallelujah, because we have you, Lord, to look to, to lift us and to give us your eyes and your perspective to see in this day and time. So we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Madeline, for that wonderful prayer. And now we want to spend some time with our family, with you. We want to share in communion together. Every first Sunday, we have communion at Pasadena Church. And what it does for us, where it's... It reminds us of all that Christ has done. It helps us to remember his sacrifice for us, helps us to remember his covenant with us. And it reminds us that Jesus is coming back again 
one day soon. So would you bring the elements forward and let's share together at the table of the Lord. And I want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. Paul says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we lift the wafer, this bread, whatever you have, we've got crackers this morning. It represents the body of Christ. The prophet Isaiah foretold that the Messiah or the Christ would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. He would take it upon himself so that with his stripes we're healed. Jesus gave his life that we might have life. And on this first Sunday in August, we take, we take the body of the Lord and we take it with joy and with confidence knowing that Jesus died for our sins. This is the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, eat all of it. And then he says, in the same way, he took the cup of the wine after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this as in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. This juice, we have grape juice, I believe. It represents for us the blood of Jesus. For the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. And the only way the sin condition of man could be atoned for or dealt with once and for all, there had to be a sacrifice that was willing and that qualified to take away the sins of the world. So Jesus comes, he sheds his blood, he gives his life so that we might have life. And that blood will never lose its power. It washes us, cleanses us. Because of his blood, we're set free and we're delivered. This beloved is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Drink all of it. Amen. And now we're going to go back into that song talking about God's love that's higher than the heavens, deeper than the oceans, greater than the mountains, the love of God. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now we're going to sing about it. His love is higher. His love is deeper. His love is greater. Hey, greater than mountains. Your love, your love, your love. It's higher. Come on. It's higher.
Anybody know about God's love? Your love lifted me. Thankful for your love. Come on, just the voices. Tell the Lord. Your love, your love, your love lifted me. Tell the Lord. Your love lifted me. Your love, your love lifted me. I am free. I am free to see of your love. Oh, bless the Lord. Amen. Thank you for just being with us. Thank you to our choir, to our worship team and our band for sharing that amazing song. If you can tell, even in the video, I get excited when I think about God's love for me. As a matter of fact, that that song reminds me of an old hymn of the church that says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. I was sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. So whenever I start singing that song about the love of God, it really gets me going. Amen. And I pray that it blessed you as well. And now I want us to go into um, the message that I have for you today. The title of my message, still con continuing on the Eracism series, it's Eracism. Now today we want to talk about the other side of justice. Yeah, that's right. You may not have known, but there's there's another side of justice that I want to present to you today. Eracism, the other side of justice. Just like I have this coin here. This is actually not a coin. It's actually a ball marker from golf, but I just pulled what I have. On the front side, we've got the seal of the state of California. And on the back side, it's got a cross kind of a marker to help you align your ball, but it's a coin for us today. And it has two different sides. And in the same way, I want you to know that when we talk about justice, when we talk about God's justice and justice of the kingdom, there's two sides to that conversation that I want us to talk about today. But before we do that, let's go back. Let's, let's talk about what what all of this conversation has been grounded on. And if you remember, we began by kind of giving an, an outline of what racism is. And I want to put it up again to say to you so that you remember, hopefully you've memorized it by now, that racism is founded by prejudice. It is funded by power and policy. It's flourished by privilege, but it can be foiled by the faithful. And that's my prayer. That's been our prayer all along, that those of us who are faithful to the Lord, we will be a part of um, that kingdom movement that's going to foil, that's going to dismantle racism once and for all. Hallelujah. And as you know, we've been looking into and looking at scripture in order to learn what God has to say about racism what God has to say about justice, what God has to say about um, how we can dismantle the systems and the beliefs that have been woven into the fabric of our country from its inception. As a matter of fact, racism, white supremacy and prejudice, prejudice has also greatly influenced the Christian church. I know I was on that last week and, and, and many of you responded, said, thank you for sharing this, Pastor. And, and some of this was prompted in my heart by reading a book called The Color of Compromise from Jamar Tisby. I highly recommend The Color of Compromise from Jamar Tisby. And in his book, he concludes that there would actually be no black church if it weren't for racism. So some of the things that we are talking about, the conversations we're having, the issues that we're facing in our nation, in our world, and even in our church are a direct result of 400 years of racism, systemic racism and prejudice, white supremacy, and all of these other entities that have influenced the, the founding of this country and that continue to ruin, ruin our nation. So we're believing that the Lord's going to help us, help us together. Amen. I found this to be true in my own spiritual background, my own church background, a movement that started around the turn of the century um, with intentions to preach the gospel to all people, black and white, without prejudice. That is the Church of God Reformation Movement. That's the name of the denomination I came out of. And I know we don't call ourselves a denomination, but it's a denomination. 
The leaders of this Church of God Reformation movement, however, eventually folded under the pressure of the times. And they begin to think, they begin to sound, they begin to act like all the others out there, not believing it appropriate for blacks and whites to worship together and grow together. And Lord knows how they felt about intermarriage. I'm not going to even go into that. But this caused a separation that still exists to this day, almost a hundred years later. We have in the Church of God Reformation movement, we have two separate churches in one. Oh, yes, I said it. I said it. They are friendly with one another. We're courteous with one another and somewhat loving towards each other, but not yet willing to do anything about that elephant. Yeah, y'all remember that elephant talking about dealing with the elephant in the room. Well, I'm, I am determined, and today I want us to do a little review. Let's keep going at this. Let's keep pressing into it. And I encourage my Church of God friends to call, to reach out to me. I'd love to have even more conversation on this matter because it's time for the church to take a stand. It's time for the church to deal with the elephants in our sanctuaries, to deal with the Stevie Wonder says, skeletons in your closet, whatever it takes to get it into our hearts and our minds to do what God's calling us to do. So let's go back for, before we can go forward and, and, and continue establishing the groundwork necessary to see these things come to fruition. We started this whole conversation, if you can remember, several weeks ago. We started with God because God is the God of justice. He is a God of justice. And the two foundational scriptures that I've been using to establish this truth, the first one comes from, you don't have to pull it up, but this one comes from Psalm chapter 103, verse 6, which declares that the Lord works righteousness and justice for all of the oppressed. One of my favorite passages, Psalm 103, I've committed it to memory. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Then it goes on to say he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. I mean, but, but the Lord is the one who works righteousness and justice for all of the oppressed. And then I want you to look at this one with me in Amos um, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24 in the message. I want to pull this one up again because this is very powerful and I want this to be something that, that stays in your heart and on your mind. In Amos um, chapter 5, verse 21 says, I can't stand, the Lord is speaking, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, my Lord, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? Hallelujah. The Lord is going to tell us what he wants. He says, I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness or righteousness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. My Lord, this passage from Amos has been ringing in my soul and my spirit for months now because I believe it is the Lord's will for us to pursue justice. I believe it is the Lord's will for us to have tough conversations around racism and around the things that divide us in our nation and in our churches. And these two passages prove that justice is God's cause. It's God's work and it's his desire. And I want to park here today just for a little while. And, and I want to let this truth sink in. And I want, I want us to make it a vital part of our understanding, the work that we're doing, the groundwork that we're laying. We've got to understand this. You see, friends, some Christians are uncomfortable, very uncomfortable with these themes. And, and many times they attempt to dilute them and pass them off to, to, other, to, special, to the specialist. Or they allow them to get lost in, in semantics. When we say things like, well, that's that social justice. You know, they, they try to expand it or to dilute it into the themes of social justice. Or they say, well, you're, you're, you're preaching the black liberation theology. And all of these things, social justice and black liberation theology are, are valid and, and they're very appropriate um, in and of themselves. 
and they're necessary subsets. However, what I'm saying to you is that justice is justice. No matter how you slice it, hallelujah, excuse my grammar, but justice is justice. There's a lot of causes. There's a lot of opportunities for us to be a part of the justice that God desires. Justice for the poor, justice for the homeless, justice for women, justice for, for those with gender issues, justice for, for those who, who, who struggle with, with the challenges of life that others would just push aside. God works righteousness and justice, and we need to be on God's side. But then today I want to explore the other side of justice. Not only is justice when we when we march and we chant about justice, but there's another aspect of justice that I want us to look into as well. You see, when we really begin to embrace justice God's way, it's not always neat. It's not always appealing to our sensibilities. I know you guys have been tracking with me with racism and justice and erasing racism. Amen. But I want to come back to justice and I want to look at the other side of justice, the other side of justice that that doesn't match what we think should be um, um, handed out to the oppressor. Those things that, th that we may think um, God should deal with someone in a certain way. And God says, no, I've got my way to do this. That other side of justice isn't always what we're asking. It's not always what we're seeking. And the outcomes don't always seem to be what we're expecting. Nevertheless, throughout Scripture, I want you to know, and this is key. If you're taking notes, this is key. Throughout Scripture, there are times when justice is being saved from your enemies. That's a picture of justice. But then there are other times when justice is your enemies being saved. My God, I don't know, what am I gonna play? I got it. Justice sometimes is, we know it's being saved from your enemies, but then justice can also be according to the scriptures when, when your enemies are saved. And I know, I know a lot of us, we don't wanna hear about our enemies being saved and delivered, but, but this is the word of God. And I wanna be very clear that while I am, I am um, focused like a laser beam on what the Lord is giving me to, pursue, um, dismantle racism, erase it, to deal with these hard themes, I know and I'm, I'm, I'm intended in all of my heart to do it the way God wants it to be done. So let's talk about the other side of justice. Can you just say that? Come on, the other side of justice. Amen. Amen. There are times when justice is being saved from your enemies. There are other times when justice is your enemies being saved. What if, what if, a law doesn't change. We're trying to change some of these terrible laws that have been on the books for, for centuries. What if the, a law doesn't change? What if a statue doesn't come down immediately? What if our nation's leaders harden in their positions instead of conceding to the demands of the people? We, beloved, must be confident that this is the Lord's cause, justice, and that he will deliver and his deliverance doesn't always match ours. As a matter of fact, one of the other songs that we should sing that, that the Lord may not come when you want him, but he will be there on time. Yet his time, his ways are not like our ways, but we must trust that he's going to do it. So, so I want to give you a couple of cases for justice. And the first case I want to present to you is the case of David. Yeah, you all know King David. David, this Mighty warrior, David who slew Goliath, David who was one known as having a heart after God's own heart. David comes into the picture here as we talk about justice as one who cries to the Lord and the Lord hears him. The Lord delivers him. As a matter of fact, in, in Psalms chapter 18, verse 3, in the NLT, the, the, the psalm reads this way. He says, I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. You see, we find David, when we talk about David, we find David often looking to, crying to, calling to the Lord to save him and not let his enemies win. And that's a powerful prayer. Hallelujah. I don't think there's anything wrong with us praying. Lord, don't let my enemies, as David said, triumph over me. I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. And we find throughout the Psalms that that time and time again, the Lord is with David. 
The Lord does deliver David from the hands of his enemy, whether it is Goliath, whether it's even um, Saul and other other countries, other peoples. God delivered David and, and, and established his throne in a powerful way. So we can look at that and say, well, well, that's how God does it. He deals with our enemies. He doesn't let them triumph over us and he destroys them. But that's not the only case that we have in front of us today. I want to present another case. See, that's David would be case number one. That's that's only one side, only one side of, 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 of this theme of justice. But the other side, come on, listen. I said the, the other side. Let's look at another case. And that would be number two, Brother Jonah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you remember Jonah. I know you remember the story, but but let me let me um, refresh your memory. You see, the Lord tells Jonah to go and announce his judgment over Nineveh, a wicked city full of wicked people. Oh, it sounds like the the country we may be living in right now, some of the areas that we find ourselves. But Jonah doesn't go. Jonah goes the opposite direction, and he hops on a ship going towards Tarshish, trying to run from God, my Lord. I don't know, you, you may be... You may be trying to run from God and you're watching this program. And I know you may have just sat up in your seat saying, saying, how did he how did he know that? How did he know to say that? Well, the spirit of the Lord um, is, is touching my heart just to say you may be trying to run from God. But we all know you can't run from God because he is omnipresent. God is everywhere. And Jonah found that out as well. So as he's on a ship going in the opposite direction from where God told him to go, God, the Lord sends a mighty storm that could shred this boat to pieces. And the storm was so bad that the other men on the boat, the sailors, they started calling on their gods, all of their gods, lowercase g's. And, and, and while they're doing this, Jonah is underneath the bows of the ship asleep. The sailor, the captain comes, say, man, how can you sleep when we're about to die? Call on your God, too. They're wondering who ticked God off for him to send this storm. They start questioning Jonah and they found out uh, after questioning him, Jonah, they found out that Jonah served the God who made the sea and the land. Can you imagine they're in the middle of this terrible storm? They they wake Jonah up. What's going on? Call on your God. Jonah said, well. My God is the one who made all of this. And they're like, well, well, come on, something's going on, brother. They question him and find this out. How can we stop it? Jonah says, the only way you can stop this storm from destroying all of us, you've got to throw me overboard. You've got to get rid of me. This is this is the Lord's doing. Throw me overboard to stop this storm. It's my fault. And they try not to do it. Amen. I I love this story because the Bible says once Jonah says that they keep rowing, they're still trying to get out of the storm. But eventually they realize the only way we can save ourselves is by throwing. So they pick Jonah up and they threw him off of the boat in the middle of the storm. And the Bible says that the storm ceased. And right at that time, don't you know that the Lord had arranged an Uber The Lord had arranged an Uber well. Amen. That's the largest Uber you can get. He arranged an Uber well, a great fish to pick Jonah up and and keep him for three days. And while he was in the, the, the stomach of that great fish, the Bible says that Jonah prayed. Not only did he pray, but he repented and he committed to fulfilling his vows to the Lord. In other words, he said, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. Can you say that? We're not even at the altar call yet, but can you say these words? Say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll fulfill my vows. And as Jonah prayed that prayer, the fish spits him out on the beach. He's alive and he's safe. And then the Lord starts right where he left off. The Lord says, go to Nineveh. And you know what Jonah said? I'm going to Nineveh. But here's the kicker. The people of Nineveh are enemies. They're wicked. They're evil. They deserve the wrath of God. And this is what the Lord was sending Jonah to do. 
So we're talking about justice, the other side of justice. The people of Nineveh, once they heard this message from Jonah, they believed God and they repented. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, as a matter of fact, come on. You've got to read how, how this how this how this happens. Jonah goes, finally goes to Nineveh, tell them, you know, 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. They said, oh, my goodness, what do we have to do? They turn from their evil ways. I'm talking about when justice doesn't turn. Some of us are so um, incensed with the way that people of color have been treated. We want those enemies of black people to be destroyed. Well, I'm not one of those. I want people to be saved. I want people to be delivered. I want change to come nonetheless. But but I, I'm praying that God will heal our land, not destroy our land. The people of Nineveh, the enemies, these wicked people believed God's message and repented. Come on, let's look at it together in Jonah chapter three, verses six through 10 in the New Living Testament, the NLT. Jonah three, verse six. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat in a heap of ashes. All of this is symbolic of sincere repentance, um, contrition and humility. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. He said, no one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. He declared a fast and said, I don't want anybody eating and drinking, not even the animals. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. Isn't this powerful? He says, I want everybody to mourn. He says, I want you to put the, the garments of mourning on your animals as well. This is complete repentance. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence, he says. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw, the Bible says in verse 10, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Oh, if uh, you know, that's powerful. And 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 it goes on. You've got to read your, your homework is to read all four chapters of, of the book of Jonah, because Jonah was upset. Jonah was upset. He was heated that God forgave Nineveh. And as we talk about justice and the different sides of justice, would you be upset if God healed our land? Would you be upset if God truly saved and delivered our president um, um, and filled him with the Holy Ghost and that with the mighty burning fire and the evidence of speaking in tongues? I don't know. But this is what we're talking about, beloved. Wanting what God wants, pursuing justice the way God pursues it and understanding those different aspects and sides of God's justice. If I had time, I would talk about Mordecai and Haman and Queen Esther. If I had a little more time, I would throw in Joseph and his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God had another plan. And that's just how God's justice works. There are a whole lot of people who mean evil. There are a whole lot of people who don't want people of color to have equal rights and equal opportunities. But God has another plan in spite of what they desire. So then let's go to our third and final case. You know, I had to end it with who? none other than you said it, Jesus. Case number three is Jesus. Jesus, the son of God, he was despised and rejected by men. Yet salvation is offered to men through Christ. Salvation is really offered to all of us through Christ in spite of the way he was treated, in spite of the rejection, in spite of the, the shame and the scorn, Jesus stayed focused on completing the father's um, assignment for his life, which was for humanity. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53, I read a little bit of it when we were um, sharing communion. I actually quoted from this passage a little bit during our time of communion. But in Isaiah 53 verses three through six, I want to read it in the message. It says right in the middle of that, it says he was looked down on and passed over. We're talking about the Messiah, the Christ. 
a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, Isaiah said, though thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that we thought that God was punishing him for his own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him, my Lord, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong on him, on him. Thank you, Lord. You see, Jesus, the Messiah that Isaiah was speaking of, he comes and fulfills every promise the father made, bringing justice, rather even more so justifying everyone who would believe in him, giving us the opportunity to be saved. This is when we talk about the other side of justice. Amen. We all deserve to die. In our case, justice demanded that we should die for the scripture states here in Rome. Got to look at another one. Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yet God had another plan. God had a greater purpose for his justice. So that today you and I, beloved, could be ministers of his reconciliation so that we could be Christ's ambassadors. David shows us um, God um, in one way and God's justice in David's life. Jonah shows us another way, even though he ran from God um, and the group that he, he went to condemn, God ended up saving them. But Jesus comes and completes this picture for us. Because we know he died that we might have life. He became poor so that we might be rich. And there's one final scripture that sums all of this up, I believe, and it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, come on, turn to this with me. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. I'm reading from the NLT. It says in verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. When we talk about eracism, we're talking about from, from, from our perspective, reconciling people to God. Verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. What does this mean, beloved? It means because of the complete work of Christ in securing our salvation for those of us who would believe in him, we are now deputized to stand up, to speak up, and to show up for others. We are the ones now who are called to continue and to carry this message. That's why I haven't moved on to the news, the latest news cycle. That's why I haven't. And we're not turning the page and talking about something else right now. We're going to stay right here until the Lord tells us to move, because this is what he desires for us now to take on this mantle and be the agents of reconciliation, of change, to be the ones who will who will attack racism and dismantle it from its roots. I pray that you would join me in this effort as we believe God together. 
Will you pray with me now? I want to pray and ask the Lord's blessing over us. And I want to give you an opportunity. If you have not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, the only way we can really do this work and even understand it is if Jesus is at the center of all that we do. He must um, take first place on the throne of our hearts. That's what we talk about when we're saying being saved or giving our lives to Christ. It simply means I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to take over my life. It's not Jesus take the wheel. No, no, no. Jesus take the whole vehicle, all of me, Lord. And if you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I'd like for you to ask him if you'd like to do that now. Will you pray with me? And those of you, you may already be believers, but I want you to pray as well. Let's ask God's blessing Let's ask God's grace to cover us as we continue to press into what he has for us and to pursue those things that we know are from the kingdom. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes? Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to share this word with my friends. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would take these words that, um, and the meditations of my heart, they'd be acceptable to you, but Lord, that they would also accomplish everything you've desired for them to accomplish. I pray for those who never intended on watching this service today, but they find themselves watching right now. Lord, that you would touch their hearts, that you would heal them, whatever it is, Lord, that may be broken in them, whatever it is that may have, that may be causing pain. Whatever it is, Lord, that may be causing separation from their family and from others, whatever it is that may be causing them, Lord, to not rely on you, I pray today will be broken, that your peace, that your justice, that your grace would prevail in Jesus' name. And if you haven't asked Jesus into your heart, just pray this simple prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And take me to be yours. I declare, Lord, from this day forward, I am a child of God. I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer um, with me for the first time, I want you to do something. I want you to text, I believe, no spaces, the letter I and then the word believe together. I believe to 626-602-1165. And let us know um, that you just, just text that word and then we will follow up with you. You don't have to put anything else in there. Just text I believe to that number and we will follow up. Why? Because we want to make sure that you make it in your newfound relationship with Christ. And if you're not able to do that, maybe you can go online to www.pasadenachurch.com. And on our website, there's a, a page that says decision card. Click that link and, and fill out the information to let us know you're making a decision to follow Christ. Or you may already be a believer, but you're renewing. You, you may have already done that in the past, but you want to renew your relationship with Christ. You may simply say, I just need the church to pray for me. You can put your prayer request right there and we will pray together, believing God for whatever you're believing him for. So please do that today. We also want all of our first time guests. We want to stay connected with you. This is your first time watching the programming or if you've been watching, but you've never taken the next step. We'd like for you to text the word hello to the number that's listed on your screen so that we can stay um, plugged in with you. And we'll let you know when we're doing things or, 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 or different things that, that we believe you would benefit from or you would like to participate in just by texting hello to that number. We'll do that. Um, and then for our church family, Pasadena church family, you already know, hopefully by now, if you would text the word member, just text the word member to that number as well. And we will keep you in the loop as to all of the things that's happening with our church. Things like our United Prayer. We have a United Prayer line every Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern time, where you can just Call in the number that's listed on your screen and you will hear somebody praying. We pray together. We share prayer requests and praise reports together as the people of God. So many wonderful opportunities for us to stay connected. So please take advantage of that. And, and as a matter of fact, talking about staying connected, there is a powerful Bible study um, that started, it started on Saturday, but you can join in right now. It's searching, it's searching the scriptures. We want you to join us 
as we are reading the Psalms together. It's called Searching the Psalms, Seeking God and Justice for 150 Days During the Pandemic. Um, we started on the first, we started on yesterday, but you can go back and read Psalm one and read Psalm two today, and then you'll be ready for Psalm three tomorrow. But we're reading one Psalm a day. And then every Friday, there's going to be a Zoom meeting at 7 a.m. There's also some literature we want to send you to help you um, almost as a devotional as you read the Psalms together. So for more information, please Jot this down. Take a moment to to reach out to Pastor Brad Arnold, who's spearheading this wonderful um, time together. Call Pastor Brad at 626-478-9755, and he'll share any other information that you need to know. Before we go, I want to remind our Pasadena church family, our local family, that we are having, oh yeah, we're having another all church Zoom gathering this evening at 7 p.m. If you're watching our 6 p.m. Um, service right after you get off, you've got to join us. But those of you um, watching our 10 a.m. service, we're going to gather this evening at 7 p.m. As a matter of fact, the screens open at 6.45 p.m. You can call into the, the a meeting early as early as 645 so that we can see each other we can wave at each other we can talk to each other and then at 7 p.m. we're going to start our meeting we have the information on the screen um, with the meeting ID and the password to be a part of this all church gathering we want to see you tonight amen finally beloved many of you are asked uh, members and those just watching, how can we give? How can we support your ministry? There's several ways to support Pasadena Church um, financially, and we appreciate every every gift that, that comes our way. You can do that online through our website, PasadenaChurch.com. We also have all of the latest mobile apps like Zelle and the Cash app. Um, with Zelle, it's info at PasadenaChurch.com, and with the Cash app, it's just I believe it's just Pasadena Church, but you can do it that way as well. You can even mail in a gift to Pasadena Church, 404 East Washington Boulevard, Pasadena, California, 91104. We say it's all good and, and we don't want to... Um, we don't want you to feel by any stretch that, that, that this is something we're forcing. We just want you to know if you can be a blessing to our church, to this ministry. Amen. If you don't have it, we want you to know that we're praying for you, believing God's going to bless you and give you the resources so that you will be able to give. As a matter of fact, I've got to share this. He's been doing that. We had another free food giveaway this past Thursday where we gave away 80 boxes of food. There's another person in our community that keeps blessing us with, with food and, and we're getting it together. We're giving it back out where there is vision. There is provision. Just want to leave that with you and want you to know that we love you and we thank God for you. Continue to follow us on Facebook, um, Pasadena Church, please. Um, all throughout the week. You can jump on there and see what's happening, what's going on. You can also follow us on YouTube under Pasadena Church Online. And just know that we love you. We thank God for you. And we can't wait to see you again. God bless you.